Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and welcome to Master Leadership, where we connect with leaders worldwide to gain insights on important topics to help us on our journey towards greater significance. If you would like to participate as a guest, or if you have a question that you would like to ask a guest, go to masterleadership.org for more information. Jonathan Raymond is the CEO of ReFound, a leadership training company that helps organizations unlock high performance through transparent conversations about growth and accountability. Jonathan spent 20 years building careers in business development and personal growth before realizing he could have the best of both worlds by starting his own company. Now he uses those skills to advise CEOs and organizational leaders on how to create a people-first culture that drives results. His goal is to provide ReFound's clients with a partner they can trust and a program that gives managers an experience of how they can make work a better place, one conversation at a time. Jonathan is an experienced CEO, Inc. Magazine Top 100 Leadership Speaker, and the author of Good Authority, How to Become the Leader Your Team is Waiting for. He lives in Encinitas, California. Our interview will continue after messages from our sponsors. Did you know that a great accountant can double your business and save you tens of thousands of dollars every single year? But it's hard to find the good ones. That's where Accountant Hires comes in. They match you with an exceptional accountant in just seven days. Every accountant in their network is rigorously tested and vetted, so you can focus on what matters. Hire a top accountant today at Accountant Hires. Go to masterleadership.org forward slash AH. That's masterleadership.org forward slash AH. If you want to make money and change lives by selling your knowledge online, do not launch an online course. Only 6% of those are ever completed. Create instead your own branded app and launch the ultimate learning experience that sells. Passion.io is a drag and drop platform where you create interactive content to sell using your own branded app. Forget any tech hassles. You deserve a platform that makes it easy. You can move your existing clients, you can reach new clients, or you can even swap your online course for something that actually works. Delight clients with downloadable and even live content. You can trigger instant action using push notifications, generate more revenue with single touch payment, and you can stream across all devices. Best yet, try it for free for 14 days Go to masterleadership.org forward slash passion and get started today. Welcome, Jonathan Raymond. How are you? I'm really well. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, we're so happy to have you. You ready to pour into our listeners? Yes, for sure. Fantastic. So tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now. If we'll fast forward from when I ran for student government in seventh grade and lost that was my first attempt at leadership, but uh, we won't unpack that one. Uh, if you fast forward uh, in the 2000s, I had gotten involved in a few different startups, some for-profit, some nonprofit, and I started to dip my toe into leadership waters, sometimes as a startup founder, sometimes as a kind of senior leader in a young company. And I really saw a couple of things. One was how desperately needed good leadership was inside some of these organizations and how challenged so many people were, not just by being a boss or the boss, but by working for other people. And I was somebody that, you know, I grew up, you know, I had jobs from when I was 13 or 14. So I was kind of always working as a kid, but I really started to see some of the challenges and how the the internal workings of a culture uh, and how people felt about themselves and how leaders treated them had such a big impact on the work itself. So that was kind of the start of my career. And then you know, sort of fast forward 
to 2011, I became the CEO of an executive coaching company, a company that had been around since the 1970s. So that was about 10 years ago was my first real experience as a CEO, even though I had been a kind of a startup founder, but Mm -hmm. running a real business about 10 years ago, and then have been in that kind of CEO seat for the last 10 years. And what are you doing now? So I run a company called Refound. Uh, We're a leadership development and training company. So we do a lot of individual coaching, group coaching. We work with organizations and we're really focusing on how to transform teams. So how to get teams of people. Sometimes that's an intact team. Sometimes that's a team across an organization. How do we get them communicating more effectively? How do we get them giving each other feedback, holding each other accountable and doing that in a really human way? I wrote a book back in 2015 called Good Authority. And uh, all of our work is based on the ideas and the principles in that book of what does it mean to be a good authority in the modern workplace, whether you're a CEO or a first-time manager, or maybe you don't manage people at all. How do you use your authority for good in the modern world of work? I love it. And where can we find you? The best way for your listeners, we'll put a specific link for your show, but refound.com is our website. And then you'll find uh, our video academy is up there. Uh, other ways to get in touch. And we have a ton of free resources, blog posts and other things like that. I love it. Thank you so much. Now, as I'm listening to your story, you observed that there was a need for good leadership early on, which tells me that is something that you're very keen in. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. (laughs) One of the compliments that one of my clients gave me recently, is sometimes they tell me something that they don't like, but this was a moment where they said, you know, one of the things that we love about you is no matter what happens, no matter how stressful it gets, no matter how much things are shifting, your response is always the same. Your response is always, oh, isn't that interesting? Let's talk about that. Let's unpack that. Why is that happening? And their experience was that was very rare. That was very hard for them to do. They would let the heat of the moment put them immediately into solution mode. And one of the things that is my superpower is I don't do that. I don't go into solution mode. Sometimes I do it with my wife. She doesn't appreciate that. Uh, But I don't go into solution mode in a business context because I know that the easy solution isn't the right one. Almost always. There's always some deeper cause. There's some deeper systemic thing that's happening. And we're going to have a much bigger impact if we take a moment and get to that. So you're observant and you're curious, which are two really important superpowers to have as a leader. Now, I'm curious, why Refound? Why that name? I had uh, led a company through a kind of three, four year corporate transformation. So everything from the business model to the brand, all the way through the way we thought about technology. And we had hired a consultant who uh, had been around the block many times And at the end of this project, he called me and, you know, the work was done. He wasn't trying to sell me on new work, but he said, hey, I just wanted to tell you something. I've been around the corporate transformation block a bunch of times, and I've seen a lot of companies reimagined. I've seen a lot of companies renewed, refreshed, but I've never actually seen a company refound where you actually brought it down to a new set of values, to a new mode of operating at the level of behavior and accountability and ownership. And it was really cool. And it was really, he really, he's like, I just really enjoyed being along for the ride. And you did that in a way that you took people with you. And it was really nice to see. And that word really stuck with me because I think for me, refound is not just a business idea. It's also a personal idea. How do we refind ourselves, especially in this crazy world that we're living in right now? Whenever this goes on the air, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and you know, dealing with that and our political divisions and what's happening with media and technology. How do we refine ourselves in that? And how do we refound our institutions, right? Because what we're seeing is that so many of our institutions are not up to the task of dealing with the complexity of our modern world. So what are we going to do about that? And so while Refound is a business-focused organization, we work with high-growth businesses, some big, some small, the word refound really carried a lot for me that it sort of bridges how do we change the institution and how do we change ourselves? Because I think both things are required. Right. And you can't remove people from businesses. You have to deal with people, right? You said something that was interesting. You said that you took people with you, which tells me that you value people and you empower people, which are also strong pillars of leadership. One of the qualities that I think really holds most leaders back is that they're not lazy enough. They have their fingers in 
everything. They're constantly stretching. They're constantly doing, 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 solving, 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 fixing, fixing, fixing. And to be an effective leader, you have to be a little bit lazy in spots. You have to be willing uh, to let somebody else do the thing, have the idea, fix the problem, solve the thing. And it's very disempowering. I'm not saying, you know, give up, don't be ambitious. Like, don't misinterpret that, anyone who's listening today. But you've got to create space. And if you're constantly operating at 140%, it's very difficult for people to find a space that they can own on your team or in your organization. Right. And so your idea of not lazy enough, to me, I interpret that as just be still. Sometimes yes. you have to just be still, right? Now, you know, you spoke about the COVID-19 pandemic that we're, I don't know where we are. are you- <laughs> we're somewhere. <laughs> I, I know. So are there any quotes, advice, or practice that has helped you during crisis? I would say the practice that has helped me most, which I would say my meditation practice, it's not anything to brag about right now. It's very haphazard. I've got two kids and a lot going on. But for big periods of my life, meditation was a discipline and a focus that I did you know, daily, sometimes multiple times a day. And that practice really stuck. So I was a hardcore meditation practitioner for 10, 15 years. And I learned some things about myself, my ability to weather the storm internally, the emotional storm to let things pass, right? You know, one of the things that, you know, you hear, you know, they can sound like cheesy quotes, but you know, this too shall pass, Mm -hmm. right? And people misinterpret and people abuse some of that wisdom that came out of the East, but it's really true, right? Things will change, give it a minute, wait a second, sleep on it. You'll feel differently about it tomorrow. And especially when it comes to the, you know, sort of the frustrations of our world, sleep on it. See how you feel about that conversation. Even if you want to have the same conversation with that person, it's going to go better if you wait until tomorrow rather than doing it today, you know, when you're hot under the collar and you're frustrated and you're, you know, whatever. So for anything that is contemplative, taking walks in the park, you know, connecting with nature in some way, realizing that as important as the things that are important to us are, there's a bigger story being written. There are larger forces at work that we don't control. And if we can sort of lean back into that reality, whether you believe in a divine being or not, that's not really the point, but you have to accept that there are a lot of things out there that we don't understand and that are not within our control. And that helps get through really difficult times. And, you know, that's important because as an educator, someone who my personality is I get things done, you know, I Mm. fix things, we're fixers, (laughs) right? I had to learn that. And I love that you bring it up again, because it just nails it home. And it reminds me, Lily, you can sleep on this, you don't have to make a decision today. And you're absolutely right. What happens to what I've learned is when I do sleep on it, I don't have to choose between A and B. Another alternative comes up that may be even better. So I love this too shall pass. And also I learned that when you're going through good things, this too shall pass, which yes. makes me grateful for that time. And so I love what you're saying there. So thank you. Yeah. Just to pick up on your last point, one of the things that I have yet to meet an organization and I've worked with a lot of them that gets celebrating, right? They don't know how to pause. They don't know how to celebrate and say, Hey, that was really good. Let's take a moment. We're good at realizing when things went wrong. And we hear this over and over again, we don't have to celebrate. We don't have to praise people. The best we do is like, good job, which is meaningless to somebody. Well, tell me, why did I do a good job? What impact did it have? What should I do more of? Like, I need way more fidelity in praise than most managers give. So exactly as you said, this too shall pass, but also recognizing those moments where something is good and it happens with your kids, right? Sharing on behalf of a friend. If you've got a disgruntled teenager, when something is good, when there's a good moment, like, Find a way to pause and say, hey, that was really good. I love that you're, you know, down here sitting with us and having dinner with us. And you're, you know, you're waiting a minute before you go up to your room. Thank you for that. It means a lot to us. You know, whatever moments you can find like that, uh, life is long, but life is short. I'm one of those people that didn't celebrate. Mm. I just kept going and I needed people in my life to tell me, Lily, you need to celebrate this. This is great. Really? Wait, hold up. What you're saying is absolutely on point, And I appreciate mm. that. Now, as a lifelong learner, which you clearly are, what are you learning right now? What I'm learning right now is how to evolve as what I would call trying to be an anti-racist. Uh, so I'm reading this book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. 
We're doing a little book club here at ReFound, and I feel like we've done an okay job of moving the conversation internally at ReFound and creating a more diverse organization and bringing some of that, some of what we're learning to our clients. But it's a subject that I'm deeply passionate about. And as a white male, middle age, uh, I feel like I have a deep responsibility to take action on. So I feel like I'm really learning about what does that mean that the next level, just to one of the things that he says in the book, which I love is he said, it's not enough to say I'm not racist. You've got to be an anti-racist. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? So I'm in the next level of my own learning on that. I love that. Thank you. Now, when you think of leadership today, Jonathan, what most concerns you and what are you most hopeful about? I would say what's most concerning to me is that people have lost the ability for a bunch of different reasons or largely lost the ability to carve out uninterrupted space to think strategically and to think creatively. And our attention, some of which was evolutionary and a lot of which is technological, our attention has been sliced up into a million different pieces intentionally by engineers in Silicon Valley, some of whom work at companies that we're trying to help. So it's not a holier than thou type of thing, but the nature of the modern internet and modern technology is it sliced up our attention and we really struggle and leaders really struggle with creating and maintaining the space to actually think forward and do scenario planning and think about what about this and what about that? Because the beeps and the buzzers and the micro tasks are driving us to become sort of rats in a cage way more than we might think. So that's the thing that concerns me the most. I was having a conversation recently about just that, how we've been conditioned, our phone dings and we're like this, um, yeah. I do myself. Um, but, you know, and, and I want to share this. I don't know if you're familiar with Clubhouse. Um, yes. You've been on Clubhouse. That's addictive. Yeah. I turned it off. Honestly, I got an invitation. I mean, you know, and I appreciate what they're trying to do. But I was like, look, if I have free time, I want to go be with my kids. I want to go spend time with my wife. I mean, there, I'm sure there's good stuff on there, but like, I'm sorry. Like, I just, I'm not into it. I like the format and makes sense, but I don't need any other thing to keep me on my phone. Mm -hmm. I get it. You know, if it's audio, maybe I could do it on walks or whatever, but it's just, for me, I value non-digital, non-information saturation time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can see if it helps you in your business. I can see the case for it. But for me, I'm looking for less. I'm looking for higher quality inputs. Uh, yes. Yeah. There are great conversations happening there, but I did find myself getting addicted and I had to be intentional about shutting that down. Right. So I absolutely right. agree with you, but it's really easy to get caught up in that. Even when you know better, right? Yeah. Well, I think that the sources that we are coming to trust and that we will trust more are the sources that are curating, like what you're doing for your audience, right? You're saying, hey, this is a half an hour worth spending because I'm talking to this person about this topic. So you're curating content and different the leaders, thought leaders, whatever, for your audience. And they trust you, right? So they say, well, Lily, if I tune into Lily, she's going to add value to my day and I can sort of put it in that. So I think that it's very, very difficult to create that space. And it's ironic because the same people that are designing so much of this technology are also the same people who are saying, oh, you should meditate you should do yoga. It's, it's kind of this Bay Area split personality, right? It's like, uh, <laughs> I lived there for 10 years. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's an, yeah, it's an interesting paradox. All right. So Jonathan, now we have an option here. You can either get a question from a former guest, or you can share a challenge, a struggle or a failure that you learned from. I'll share a failure that I learned from, which is, and this happened to me many times, but one in particular where I learned that while I, in my head had, this was about five years ago, I had feel like I had communicated to my team and I was so clear about the direction we were going and what we were trying to accomplish and what our resources were and what the goals were. And I feel like I had spent 50 meetings talking with my team and talking with individuals. And even then, it wasn't enough. This was heartbreaking to me. They came to me and they, one of the guys on my team and he said, yeah, I get all that, but like, uh, I don't really understand. Like, what is this project about? And I was like, no, 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 no. How can this possibly be, right? And so I learned in that moment through failure, just what it takes 
And it's not only repetition. It's, sometimes it's repetition, but it's also getting beneath the surface to really understand why don't people understand the why behind a project instead of just repeating, well, here's the why, here's the why, here's the why. There's some block and why they don't understand it or why they don't value it or why they don't think it's the most important thing. And if you really want to create deep alignment on your team, that's what you got to do. And I was baffled by why that was so hard. And as I said, I've, I've had that come uh, many times, but I learned in that moment, okay, I need to ask some different questions and get beneath it. And then I don't have to repeat myself as much. So what's one question that you started to ask differently? One question that I would ask is I would try to name the thing rather than solve the thing. And this is a skill that translates across all of leadership and all of life is I would say to that person, hey, I'm noticing that in our meetings, I feel like we covered that ground, but we keep covering it. And so the hairs go up on the back of my neck. And I think to myself, oh, there must be something off about our approach. I don't know what it is. Do you know what it is? Love it. That does happen a lot in education, which is why I'm so curious about Mm. how you look at that. Thank you so much for that. Now, as a listener of this podcast, what is a question that you would like a future leadership guest to respond to? Like, what are you curious about? What I'm curious about, we're hot on the trail of this now, is how are you crossing the knowing doing gap? So how are you taking what you know to be a good leadership idea and getting people to actually implement that idea in the chaos of their day-to-day life? How are you taking what you know and actually doing it, right? So it doesn't just stop as like a good idea. That's a great question. Thank you. All right. So Jonathan, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Hang in there. It's a difficult, difficult time, you know, depending upon where you are and what the regulations are around COVID. You know, it's been a time of great isolation and loneliness and disconnection. And I hope, my wife would tell you I'm a perpetual optimist. I hope that we are hitting a transition point where we are realizing that the way we're living doesn't work. And I think that is happening. I think that's going to happen on climate. I think that's happening on education. I think that's happening on health and wellness. I think it's happening in food. And I think we are hitting bottom as a culture. And hitting bottom is messy, right? You look out in the world and we see, you know, the QAnon craziness and all this. People are looking for big answers. When people are looking for big answers, even if those big answers are crazy and don't make any sense, you got to look below the surface and say, well, why are people looking for such big answers? It's because there's a lot of pain. Mm. And there's a lot of pain in our world right now. So if you look at it that way, you can say, okay, well, through great pain comes the potential for great transformation. And I think that's where we're at. So hang in there, reach out to the people you love and care about, have those extra conversations, you know, find ways to connect with people in real time, even if it's over video, don't overdo it with the Zooms. Mm. And I do think we're going to be in a better world in these next couple of years, but I think it's going to take some time. And you know, another word that just came as you were talking is compassion, how compassionate Mm. you are, which is really important in leadership. Mm. I so value you and I thank you so much Mm. for adding value to me and to our listeners. It's been a great conversation. Thanks, Lily. I really appreciate being on your show. Have an amazing day. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.